worship you our Lord you are worthy to be praised we give you all the glory we worship morning. Welcome to Grace and Peace Austin. Uh, we are a gospel-formed family for the city and there's room for you. My name is Mac Metter. I'm the music director here and it is a joy and a privilege to come together to worship um, even in this odd time online. So the first thing that we often do in worship is to stand together if you're willing or able to respond to this call to worship that comes from First Chronicles this week. And so why don't we stand together um, and this is a bit of a call and response. I'll do the celebrant part and you'll reply with the people part. So let's call ourselves to worship together. Be called to worship. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy. Before the Lord he comes to judge the earth. O give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's pray to you. Lord, your steadfast love does endure forever, God. I pray that this service, you will be with us as we sing and we pray, God, as we learn and hear your word. Um, help us to see and know that love in a deeper way um, as we continue on in this worship. In your name we pray, amen. Let's continue on in our um, song of worship, Oh, four thousand tongues to sing. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. Friends, as we have the opportunity now to confess our sins, remember that we confess our sins in the name of Jesus, relying upon his finished work on the cross on our behalf for our forgiveness. And so as we pray in his name, our confession is indeed life and health and peace because of Jesus. Let's pray now together, followed by a time of private confession to God. Join me. We need your healing, merciful God. Give us true repentance. Some sins are plain to us. Some escape us. Some we cannot face. Forgive us. Set us free to hear your word to us. Set us free to serve you. Amen. Take a moment now. Make that prayer your own 
and private confession to God. Amen. Let me invite you to lift up your head. Go ahead and smile. Receive this good word of assurance that is yours in Christ Jesus. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from us. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve us. Friends, if your faith is in Jesus, this promise is yours and you are forgiven. You are loved. You are preserved. You will be standing and enjoying the presence of God at the end for all eternity in Christ. A good word indeed. Let's respond as we sing together, yet not I, but through Christ in me. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep
we'll turn to our New Testament this morning, which comes from Ephesians 7, or sorry, Ephesians 3, 7 through 13. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. This is the word of the Lord. And now we'll send it to Jeanette, who will lead us in the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come before you today with heavy hearts, for the darkness seems to be closing in. Burdened by the brokenness in our own hearts and in the world around us, we stumble, tempted to give up the fight, to surrender. But we will not. We fight on. We lock arms with the saints through all time and space and march into battle tumult. We take up the whole armor of God so that we can stand, stand with our Father at our head, stand with Jesus Christ, our elder brother and captain going on before, with the indwelling spirit and the whole host of heaven at our backs. With one unified voice, we have a message for sin, hell, and the devil. Get out, be gone, and never come back. You have no place in our Father's world, in our relationships, in all that God meant to be good and right in the world, in our lives, or in the lives of the ones we love, Indeed, in the lives of the ones you love, O oh Lord, the ones you love so much that you sent your son to die, rise, and live again. It is on this basis that we repeat again and again, though sometimes through tears, that the story Satan wants to write of sin, disappointment, and despair will not be remembered, that he will not deter the gospel going forward or silence our song or steal our joy for the course of human history has already been overwritten by a story infinitely greater in its majesty, glory, and power, one consecrated by the broken body and written with the spilt blood of the Prince of Peace. It is with this story that we align our lives, our loves, and our hopes. And yet we recognize that we don't see the glory of this story yet in its fullness, and we're left in a broken world with broken hearts, and what seems sometimes like only a shadow of life left to live. So we ask for the next breath to inflate our collapsing lungs, the words to call out one more time, to affirm our faith and our hope, though it may only be a whisper, just enough animation in our feet to take one more stumbling step into your outstretched arms, for we know that you will not let us collapse anywhere else. This we pray looking to the day when we will breathe the air of your freedom in full measure and our feet will no longer be made of lead. In particular this day, we lift up those who are wearied by long suffering, give them stamina. Those who have been blindsided by a new challenge they never saw coming, give them strength to stand, to bend and not break. And those with a deep longing and ache that nothing on earth seems to satisfy, Give them the satisfaction and rest that is only found in your person and presence. In the matchless name of your Son, whoever lives to reign and intercede for us, and who taught us the prayer we're about to sing. Let's sing together the Lord's Prayer now, the song Father in Heaven. Father in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come on earth, your will be done today. 
day Give us each this day Daily bread we need Give us all our sins As we've forgiven others Lead us far from temptation From the evil one Save us in times of trial Amen. Well, now it is time to turn and pass the peace that we have in Christ to one another. Um, we do that by uh, saying it to each other in the chat box, the peace of Christ be with you, or those that you're sitting on the couch with at home, or whatever fits where you are right now. So let's peace, sorry, pass the peace of Christ to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's greet one another with a sign of Christ's peace. We'll continue on in our worship now by singing the songs used together. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full, full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. If you're still standing at home, feel free to take a seat. Our gospel reading this morning is found in the gospel of Luke, chapter 5, the first 11 verses. Hear the word of the Lord. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you said so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. We do ask, Jesus, that these words would be your words to us and for us, uh, that they would carry your power and your grace, that they would change us, uh, maybe a little, maybe a lot this morning. 
we all have this in common. None of us have it all together, and we need your grace. We need it at every moment, and so we need it at this moment. We ask for it boldly in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Let me add my welcome to Max. I'm John. I'm the pastor here at Grace and Peace, and it's good to be with you. It's good to be with you in the backyard with the fig tree one more time. Uh, we were run out of the sanctuary with construction noise, but we're so glad to be out here in God's beauty with you, uh, reflecting upon God's Word together. And that is what we're doing. In this particular sermon series this fall, we've been uh, parking in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to move on into the book of Acts soon. And we're asking and seeking to answer the question, what does it mean for us as a congregation to be God's people for this time? What does it mean for us as a congregation to be God's people for this time? And so we're seeking to answer that question by looking at our identity, who are we, and our purpose, what are we about? And we've been thinking about our identity in Trinitarian terms, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We started with the Son, that we've said we are, as a people of God, those who have been united around the gospel of Jesus and centered upon the good news of Jesus. Uh, We are also God's called and chosen and commissioned people. God's people centered upon the gospel, empowered by the Holy Spirit. So last week uh, we looked uh, at Luke chapter 7 and noticed that we are God's people who are part of his story. And this week in Luke chapter 5, as we look at the call of these first disciples, we're going to remind ourselves that we are God's people who are chosen and commissioned. We are part of God's bigger story and we are part of God's bigger people. His bigger people uh, in terms of his church spread around the world today, right at this moment, and his greater people uh, who have existed throughout time for his purposes. That's who we are. And so as we dig into that a little bit, uh, maybe that context will help give us some uh, instruction and implication as we think through what does it mean to be God's people for this particular time. I really love the way that this passage begins. (coughs) Excuse me. You're not going to believe this. I just swallowed a mosquito. Part of the dangers of being outside. But we're going to carry on. Verse 1, on one occasion. What a great beginning for a gospel story, a story about Jesus. On one occasion, Luke says, as if there are tens of occasions, hundreds of occasions, thousands of occasions like this in which Jesus does his thing. And of course, Luke can say that because there were and there are hundreds of thousands of on this occasion, Jesus does his thing. And what is his thing in this passage? Well, he is calling and he is conscripting. He is choosing, if you will, and he is using. He's calling his people so that they can be part of his purpose. He does this all the time and in all sorts of places. I just heard a story the other day about uh, refugee camps. I believe uh, this particular one was in Somalia, but refugee camps that are struggling during COVID-19. And the conditions that were challenging are even more so, particularly for the most vulnerable and the young. It was a heartbreaking story. Uh, Here's the deal. On such an occasion, Jesus is calling a church for that particular time. There is a church in the Rohingya refugee camp on the border of Myanmar and Bangladesh. There is a church for God's purposes in Tokyo. There's a church for God's purposes in the Suki neighborhood of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. There's a church for God's purposes in Mueller here in Austin. There's a church for God's purposes all over the world right now. On one such occasion, Jesus was calling his people to be his people for a particular place. That was true in the first century for these first disciples. It's just as true for Grace and Peace Austin at this particular moment. And so what does it mean for us to be God's church for this time? Well, it means recognizing that we're not going it alone, that we are part of something bigger. Again, part of God's bigger story 
and part of God's bigger people. This, by the way, is what we mean when we recite the Apostles' Creed and say that we believe in the communion of saints. God has a people. It's bigger than this group of people that we are a part. It spans the globe and it spans the time of history past and history and, uh, yeah, history future. Is it history if it's future? It's not. Right? But God's people in the past and in the future. Uh, let's look at this story and then uh, see how this story helps us understand in light of this context of the communion of saints of which we're a part, how we see ourselves and how we see our work. Okay, if you're a note taker, how we see ourselves and how we see our work. But first, the story. I've been saying this a lot lately, I know, but this is one of my favorite gospel stories. It draws you in, doesn't it? It makes you wish you were there so that you could imagine what it would be like to be standing on that lake. So let's set the scene again. Jesus is teaching. He's teaching about the kingdom of God that he has come to establish. And at this particular moment, he has to do some creative engineering. There's a space challenge and there's a sound challenge. The crowds have come and they've pressed in and they pressed them all the way back to the shore of Lake Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee. As we know it, there's nowhere else to go. And the problem is Jesus can't get his voice out to all of the crowd so that they can hear him. But he sees some boats on shore and some guys had been out on the lake and they'd been fishing all night. So we know it's morning now. They're tending their nets and Jesus says, hey, I'm gonna get in your boat. Can you take me out into the water a little bit? And here's what he's doing. They're in a little inlet, a peninsula, if you will, of water. And so Jesus gets in the boat and goes out and it creates an amphitheater of sound. And so he can speak in a regular speaking voice. Everybody can hear him. It solves the space problem. Well done, Jesus. And so he does his thing, he teaches. He teaches about the kingdom and he finishes teaching and the story could be done there. But it's not because Jesus continues to do what Jesus does. Calling people to himself so that he can commission them to be a part of his work. And so imagine if you're in the crowd. Put, put yourself into the crowd now. And Jesus has finished teaching. And remember, the acoustics are good. And so even though Jesus and Peter are not addressing you, Simon, by the way, is Simon Peter. Peter of the three uh, primary disciples, Peter, James, and John and so they're talking and you can overhear them and you can see with their body language what's going on and Jesus is basically saying row out a little bit and drop your nets into the water and you can see Peter's shoulders shrug as he sighs and he says to Jesus Jesus we're tired we've been doing this all night but listen you are master and Lord and so if you say it we'll do it and you sympathize with Peter because Peter's a professional fisherman. He knows what's up. And if he's been out all night and caught no fish, there's no way in the morning with the sun beating down that he's going to catch fish. And yet they do it, they cast their nets, and then everything goes crazy, right? Everything speeds up and all of a sudden the boat is tipping. It's about to go under. Everybody's screaming and they're laughing because there are just fish everywhere. They call their buddies from the shore. They bring the second boat out. They load that boat out. Both boats are sinking. They kind of get them into shore, half sinking, half afloat. They pull them up on the shore. They collapse in hysterics and enjoy because what just happened? Not everybody is laughing. Peter gets on his hands and knees, probably on his face at Jesus' knees, and he says, I need to get out of your presence because I'm not worthy to be with you. It's this moment of recognition. Peter knows that something is up with Jesus. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. And you can hear this. Don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be fishing for people. You don't know exactly what that means. You get the sense that Peter doesn't know exactly what that means either. And yet, Jesus walks away. And Peter gathers up his stuff, along with James and John, and maybe Andrew is there too, Peter's brother, and they follow Jesus, and away they go. Something has happened in this scene, and you know it. You just don't know exactly what it is, but you know this much. In some sense, it wasn't just those fish who were caught. Peter has been caught, and now Jesus is asking him to go catch. And you wonder, maybe you'll be next to be caught and become a catcher 
of others. That's the story. How does this help us see ourselves? Well, who are these people, these fishermen? Who is Peter? Who are James and John, brothers? Who are the rest of the twelve? On the one hand, we don't know a ton about them from the Bible. We know that for the most part, they were pretty ordinary followers of Yahweh, of the God of Israel. Uh, some were small business owners, like these fishermen. Uh, one was a zealot, sort of a religious political radical. One was a tax collector, um, sort of the morally lowest of the low. There are a couple twins. We don't know a whole lot. We're not told a whole lot, and that's part of the point. And the point is this, that those who are called to be God's people through faith in Jesus and by following him are not called because their choice, they're called because they're chosen. Did you catch that? They, we, are not called because we're choice, we're called because we're chosen. In other words, on the one hand, there's nothing special about ourselves. Those of us who have had the privilege of the gift of faith in responding to Jesus. It's not as if God from heaven has been looking down from his helicopter with his spotlight and he's scouring the counties and communities and he's looking for that church. You know what I'm talking about, that church that's getting it right, that church that's doing it right, that church that has its ministry firing on all cylinders so that God can find that church and say, yeah, you, that's the church I need. Man, I'm so glad I found you because if I didn't find you, I would have never been able to do this on my own. It sort of sounds ridiculous when we put it that way, but sometimes we feel that way. We assume implicitly, but because we're chosen, it means we must have been choice. And yet that's not the case with these disciples. That's not the case that we find in all of Scripture. If you think about or go back to the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, when God is choosing Israel to be his nation of people, he says this about them, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the people who are on the face of the earth, and listen, it was not because you were more in number than any of the other people that the Lord has set his love upon you and chosen you, for you are the fewest of all peoples. He goes on to say two chapters later, it's not because of your righteousness that I chose you. He says, no, it is because the Lord loves you. You see, friends, we as a congregation, as part of this communion of saints that have been called by Jesus to himself, as we understand this context of who God's people are, we understand ourselves better. And that begins with a heavy dose, a healthy dose, I would say, of humility to recognize it's not all about us, it's about God and his love. Why did he choose us? We don't know except that he loves us. It was true for these disciples, it's true for us as well. So we learn first about ourselves that we ought to be humble when it comes to being God's people and doing God's work. On our knees is not the most comfortable or natural position for most of us and yet, Peter shows us that that's the appropriate position for those who are responding to the grace and call of Jesus. Well done, Peter. On the one hand, what do we know about these disciples and what do we know about us? On the one hand, there's nothing terribly special. On the other hand, we know that there's something radically special about these disciples and about anybody who is chosen because we are chosen, because the God of the universe, the God who created the heavens and the earth by the power of his word, the God who will not rest until he restores his universe and reconciles his people to himself, that very God has chosen you and he has chosen me if you've given yourself to Christ in faith. Not only are these disciples chosen by Jesus, even though there's nothing special about them, they become the new 12. They are the first group of Jesus' church. Think of the 12 tribes of Israel. And Israel failed to be God's people accomplishing his purpose, except for one faithful Israelite. Do you know who that was? You do. 
Kids, you know this. What's the answer? Who was faithful Israel? Jesus was faithful Israel. The one, the one remnant who was faithful. And now Jesus is reconstituting. That's the big word. He's restarting the people with these 12. These 12 ordinary people, they are the beginning of God's new people. That is extraordinary. On the one hand, we're perfectly ordinary. On the other hand, we're extraordinary in that we have been loved and called and then commissioned. Right? These are the 12 who God is going to use to point the world to Jesus and his redeeming work and power. And so, friends, as we think about ourselves in that light, in the light of this communion of the saints, we think about ourselves with humility, but we also think about ourselves with confidence and with boldness because we too have been chosen just as they were. Jesus picked you and he picked me and it doesn't really matter why, it only matters that he did. And in that picking, we are loved and equipped and tasked with a real job, a big job, the most important job we could ever have, the job of pointing a world who desperately needs a savior to the savior himself, Jesus. We've been caught so that we can then go catch others for Jesus, bring them to him so that he can do his saving and redeeming and restoring and redemptive work and their life as well. Friends, this is hard to wrap our minds and our hearts around. That on the one hand, God can do his salvation without us. He is God and we are not. And that is true. And yet, in his mysterious wisdom, he has decided he's not going to do his work without us. He's going to do his work through us. Think about this for a moment as you think about who we are. We are the people right here in Austin, right now, of whom God has said, I am not going to do my work without you. In that sense, only because God has decided it, we are indispensable and irreplaceable for his purposes and his work. That is extraordinary. Be encouraged. Be humbled, but be encouraged. Pardon the technical difficulties. Appreciate you hanging in with us. We're now uh, filming on a smartphone, so there you go. Uh, in God's providence, we are indispensable and irreplaceable. What an amazing truth that is. Uh, it reminds me of uh, growing up. My dad was a contractor. He would build houses, sell houses. That was his livelihood. It's the way that he put food on the table for me. I was grateful. Uh, and here's the crazy thing. He would have us work for him while we were probably middle schoolers. I remember one time we were painting a house and my brother and I were in one side and my sister was in the other side and my sister was rolling the paint on the wall and hitting the ceiling every single time. And my brother and I thought it was the greatest thing ever because she was gonna get in big trouble. It wasn't the greatest thing ever because we had to fix it. <coughs> and yet here's the crazy thing. We were doing real meaningful work for my dad. This wasn't just uh, work that he gave us and uh, sort of that we pretended to do while he did the real work so that we could spend time with him. No, this was work to get the job done so that he could get paid. And that's a little glimpse into what God is doing when he calls a people to himself and not just chooses but conscripts us into his service. What an amazing privilege. We see ourselves both humbly and boldly also, as we look at this passage with these disciples, not only do we know how to see ourselves, we know how to see our work a little bit more clearly. The work that God is calling us to do right here in Austin at this moment. A couple things and then we'll be done. The first thing that we see about our work is that we don't have to know the details, every detail of the work in advance to be able to take part in the work. Right? Jesus calls Peter and the other fishermen to follow him and to fish for people. Do you, have, do you think they knew what that meant? That they were gonna go fish for people? Maybe they sort of knew a little bit. They had no idea the full extent of what it meant for them to become Jesus' disciples and be fishers of people for him. And yet, what did they do? They gathered up their things and they followed him so that they could get to work. Friends, in this pandemic time, as a congregation, it's so tempting to want to ask and answer definitively and with great detail the how questions and the what questions. What does it look like to 
gather for worship in this time? What does it look like to be effective in our discipleship and care ministry? What does it look like to love our neighbors well in a pandemic time? Can we have the details, please? And the answer is no, we don't get all the details in advance, and yet that doesn't have to derail us from the task because it's not our work that will win the day. It's the work of Jesus. And all he's asking us to do is be faithful and follow. So we don't have to know the details of the job. We don't have to know the ability and where the ability, where the power is going to come from to get the job done. How do we be an effective church in the midst of a pandemic in enough ways to make a dent in the hurt and the helplessness and the challenge and the sorrow in people's lives? How can we do that? Well, the answer is, of course, we can't. But Jesus can. In fact, Jesus did everything that needs to be done on the cross and in his resurrection to accomplish redemption. Our job is simply to point to him. And even the job of pointing to him gets to be done with his strength in us and through us. I love that part of this story. Peter... (coughs) And James and John have just seen Jesus do a miraculous catch of fish. They're the professionals. And Jesus is the teacher. He's the rabbi. And he comes and he enables them to catch more fish than they've ever caught in their life through his power and the ability. And so as they go on into this new task of being his people with his purposes, they know that they've got him working for them, in them, through them. He can get the job done. And friends, the same is true for grace and peace, Austin. So though the work is crucially and critically important for our friends and our neighbors, it doesn't have to be intimidating for us because it doesn't rely upon our ability. Last thing to think about, we don't have to do everything. God is not calling grace and peace, Austin, to accomplish all of his purposes. He has a communion of saints. Those disciples were called for a particular purpose, to be faithful for the next thing that Jesus asked them to do. The same is true for our congregation. The same is true for the congregations around the world. The same is true for the congregation across the neighborhood. God has something for them. He has something for us. It's not our job to do everything. It's simply our job to do to be faithful with the next thing. And so maybe we could end with this. What is the job? Well, that's the subject of the second half of our sermon series. But I can say this at the very least from this passage. Our job here at Grace and Peace Austin is to be obedient to Jesus in front of other people. It's to be obedient to Jesus in front of other people. Put yourself back in that crowd. You're watching what's happening. And what are the disciples doing? What are the fishermen doing? They're being obedient to Jesus as you watch them. And as you watch them, what's happening? You're wondering. Ought I to do the same thing? Is there something about the way that those people are following that master that I want to be a part of? And so friends, in our worship, in our life together, and in our service, let's be obediently faithful to Jesus and let's do it in front of our friends and neighbors, remembering that we're a part of something so much bigger than our own little moment. The communion of saints. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity as we're filming to be outside and enjoying your good creation. We thank you for the opportunity as we listen together to your word uh, here on Sunday morning in our living rooms. We thank you that you are present with us. Do what you do for us and through us. We'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, the band is going to play an offertory now. It's an opportunity for us to reflect on God's goodness to us. Uh, for members and friends of Grace and Peace to give back to God through our tithes and our offerings. Of course, there's no obligation to give. Use this moment to meditate and continue to reflect upon this gift of God choosing us to be his people. Enjoy the music. Speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thine erring children lost and lone. Oh, strengthen me that
to stretch out a loving land to wrestlers with a troubled sea. Oh, teach me, Lord, that I. I see thy rest, thy joy, thy glory share. Would you join me as we continue responding to the good news? that we've heard in this gospel passage as we profess our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. Let me ask you, O Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing together. Bring forth the kingdom of God. like to let's stand together at home as we sing.
Let me invite you now to lift up your heads and your hearts to receive God's benediction, his good and his sending word to you. May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our maker, Jesus Christ, our master, Jesus Christ, the one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. Amen. Would you go forth remembering who you are and to whom you belong? With God's help, we will go in his peace. Well, friends, it was a joy to worship together this morning, um, both online just now and then the two morning services we had in person um, have been a joy. And if you have not come yet, we'd love to have you come. Come join. Uh, those links for, to RSVP for those go live on Tuesday mornings um, around 9 o'clock on their website, on the front page of the website. A couple quick announcements. The first one I'll give, um, if you have been attending, whether just visiting or um, looking to get more plugged into this church, um, a couple ways to do that. First would be email Jeanette, which is, I guess we'll probably put it up on the screen, but it's J-E-A-N-E-T-T-E -E -T -T -E at graceandpeaceaustin.com. She would love to get you connected in ways uh, or find out ways that you can get more connected into our church. The second way to get connected um, is next Sunday, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, right after the, the, um, the second, is it going to be after the second yeah. in-person? Um, so after the second in-person worship service, we'll have a, a newcomer's brunch of sorts. It'll be somewhere really nearby where that um, service happens. And we'd love to get to know you a little bit more. love to um, let, let you guys meet some of each other a little bit more. Um, and it'd be great. All right. Well, I'll hand over the second one. Yeah. Hey, Grace and Peace family, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I have one quick announcement about student ministry. We will be meeting this Sunday via Zoom. And I have sent the Zoom link to you via your email. Uh, and so if you could please check that, that'd be much appreciated. A fifth grade through sixth grade will be meeting at 12, and seventh through eighth grade will be meeting at 1.30. Pleasure seeing you guys, uh, and hope to see you there. <laughs> Speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thine erring children lost and lone. Thy rest, thy joy, thy glory.